So it is one o'clock and I'll say very good afternoon to uh, everyone. For those that don't uh, know who I am, my name's Alan Boyd and my call is Victor Echo 3 Alpha Juliet Bravo. I am the Vice President of uh, the Radio Amateurs of uh, Canada and I'm here as your moderator uh, this afternoon. We have a great presentation uh, for us on uh, public service events, leadership, um, imperatives and pre-event uh, preparation in regards to what you can do from your local clubs and that. We have our presenter, uh, Vince uh, De Leon, uh, V6LK, uh, who is uh, one of our presenters and uh, he has a, a video and PowerPoint uh, presentation, which I'll uh, be queuing up here in just a minute or two. And uh, we'll go from there and um, with that. So without any further ado, we will open it up to questions and answers. If you do have a question, you can type it in the chat room. Myself and uh, Jason Tromblay uh, is also aboard uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, Jason uh, V3JXT is our community services uh, officer uh, with us. And uh, we also have uh, I see our president, uh, Phil McBride, uh, with us too. So, Al, if, can I ask yes? a question? Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. It's Brad V3MXJ. Um, is this not supposed to be the emergency disaster community service presentation? Am I no, wrong? No, no, this is track two. We're uh, doing the public service uh, event oh. uh, leadership and imperative uh, pre event. Uh, Oh, it says here two p. It said here at two p.m. for that. So, on the the what I have anyway. So okay, sorry about that. I guess I'm in the wrong. There was okay. So just so we don't go through any, there was a change in the scheduling. Vince is on first, and I am on next. Oh, right. okay. So you just stay right here. Okay, not a problem. Sorry to interrupt, Al. Uh, back to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, with it, thank you, Jerry Jason, for the clarification on that. I wasn't aware. All right. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. And uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Vince. And uh, uh, just give me two seconds, Vince, and I'll. Uh, when you're ready to go, I'll uh, start your video. Well, thanks very much. I'm honored to be here this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, with you all. Uh, Alan, you can hit the play button anytime because uh, it starts off right with an introduction and gets into the meat of the topic. Uh, thank you all for coming. Okay, just give me two seconds here. We'll just get this uh, queued up with it. Uh, it's awesome to see so many uh, familiar faces and names uh, this morning, this afternoon too. Thanks so much. Okay, can everybody uh, see that? Yeah, it's good, Alan. Okay, very good. And uh, just give me another two seconds. I want to make sure I get the audio uh, changed over here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, make sure that's checked. That's checked. Got that. Zoom's wonderful as long as it all works together. So thank you for your patience. All right, let's get started. Here we go. Hello and welcome to How I Deal with the Unexpected or the more formal title yeah. of Leadership Imperatives and Pre-Event Preparation. I'm Vince Dion, VE6LK, and I've been operating portable and at events for over 20 years. I'm going to tour you through my Go Kit that was born after my experiences in disaster response and several public service events where things went unexpectedly wrong. And I'm gonna share with you the key design points around building your own kit. This would be a common theme. Yeah, it is. So what's happening here? Uh, I think it's stopped here. Again, could I get people to mute your microphones? Because we are hearing uh, the comments and that. Okay, give me a second and I'll go back here. Uh, 
<sighs> what do we got going here? Can I assist, Alan? Yes, if you could, uh, Marcel. Uh, for some reason, the uh, uh, the link is uh, locked up. Um, let me uh, go back and uh, go here. I do have the meeting. Okay, so I have a key. I am prepared to deliver it live, gentlemen, if need be. No, I've got it. I've got it here. Hang, hang on. that's up on the screen those are my lists at points during the presentation starters, i'm going to invite you to so grab you alan it's uh, locked up it's locked up again i'd have them okay do it live okay hang hang tight here It's okay, we'll edit this out later on, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your patience as Al's switching over here so the vids can go live. Marcel, I will need to have permission for screen sharing, please. Okay, let me get, just give me two seconds here, Vince. I think I've got it figured out now. Um, let me go here. I apologize again, ladies and gentlemen, for this. Um, now, let me go here. Vince, you should be able to share okay now. Okay. Um, just yep, that's working. Thank you so much. Okay. I've got, just let me uh, try it here, Vince, and if this doesn't work, then we'll, uh, we'll go uh, with yours. Go right ahead, Alan. Okay. No, sorry. Go live, yes. please, Vince. Yeah, yeah, All right. please. Ladies and gentlemen, if it weren't for Memorex, we would not have the option to go live. Good morning and welcome to How I Deal with uh, the Unexpected, <laughs> or the more formal title of Leadership Imperatives and Prevent Preparation. My name is Vince Dion, I'm VE6 Lima Kilo. I've been operating portable and at events for over 20 years. I'm going to today tour you through my go kit that was born after my experiences in disaster response and several public service events uh, where things went unexpectedly wrong. And I'm going to, uh, at several points through the presentation, I'm going to invite you to grab a copy of what's on screen. These are, these are the core of my checklist and these are my gifts to you uh, for attending today. It's my hope that you're gonna come away from this presentation with a set of usable checklists that'll help you prepare for your event as a leader or as a participant. So I'm going to bounce around a bit in topics with you today. I'm going to cover uh, off who I am. So you've got a bit of my background. I'm going to talk about some stories from the field. I'll talk about pre-event preparation, managing your team and managing yourself. And strangely, they're pretty close to the same thing. Field kit designed to support events and uh, leadership imperatives. So I got interested in amateur radio at age seven by uh, my dad's cousin, Uncle Al. And finally, I got around to, at age 40, finishing my licensing. I started at age 18, but I didn't complete it. Morse code was um, uh, a bit of an impediment for me at age 18, and other things in life were more interesting at that time. So I never, I never did complete, but I did sit in the DOC office once. At, in public service, my very first event for me was a tremendously fulfilling learning experience. 
And I'll tell you that story today. I've never told that story before out in public. I'm certified in ICS at level 300 and probably need a refresher. It's been a little while. I'm the Oxcom AEC for the Alberta Foothills area. I'm a podcast team member on the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. You can hear us on uh, all your favorite podcast players every two weeks. Uh, I've been giving remote exams in Canada and the USA since the pandemic began. I help out with repeaters and projects in my club, and I'm a, I'm a builder, and I build stuff for my radios to make my hobby more enjoyable. Many of us enjoy doing public service events uh, despite the inherent challenges. I got into ham radio with really only that aspect of the hobby in mind, and I've explored uh, many other areas since first licensing. For me, this quote really is the one that brings it all home. Uh, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. So before I get into the meat of the presentation, I want to set the stage. Let, get your mindset in with me for just a minute. Put yourself in my shoes as either a participant or the lead ham radio operator at an event of any sort. And most of us have done public service events of some kind. The radio is on your hip, or maybe it's in your chest pack, and your watch is in 24-hour time, and maybe there's two time zones displayed, local and Zulu. And you've got a clipboard and a pencil and paper. Are you ready? All right, let's go. So my first experience was at Rally Sport. I'm a new radio operator. I'm one of 25 people assigned to the event, and I'm given two instructions. Meet here on Saturday at 7 a.m. and directions to get there. Pretty much the definition in the middle of nowhere here in Southern Alberta. And, and when I arrive, wait here for further instruction. And then everybody left. I didn't get any further instruction kind of wandering around a little bit, a little bit clueless. And I run into this uh, gal named Deb. And Deb says, who are you? And I said, I'm Vince. I'm a ham radio operator. And I seem to have been left behind. Who are you? And she explains to me, she's the event scoring coordinator. So she's on non-ham. She's on the, the event side. And she says, oh, you must be my scoring radio operator. She showed me what to do. The reporting of scoring and timing was impacted. It wasn't done nearly as smoothly as it could have been if I'd have received a bit of pre-training. I figured it out with Deb's help. Thank you, Deb. She's still awesome to work with. And I vowed there's not a chance that I would ever let this happen ever again to anybody that was under my watch. That was the single most frustrating event. And I was ready to walk away and never come back. The second defining event was perhaps for many of you people, you, you know a bit of my story, uh, the 2013 Southern Alberta floods. I led the amateur radio response in High River, the hardest hit area that year. I was on duty for almost 72 hours during the flood and before the water had receded from the town of High River. Before I get into the story here, though, here's some images to give you the scope of what we had faced. This is 100 yards from our backup emergency operations center, where the intersection became a makeshift helipad. Just 100 yards west of that photo and wet of that photo, the landing pad you just saw, here's people being brought back in in rock trucks and front end loaders and boats. And the water came up incredibly quickly. At the EOC, you can see uh, the antennas of my old truck in the foreground. Uh, here's evacuees uh, getting unloaded before they get moved off to other reception centers. And inside an EOC, it's hot and noisy and cramped. And this is the backup EOC, and it's designed for 15 people, and it's holding 60. You don't see all of them in this photo. Uh, it was taken minutes before the arrival of the provincial premier on the third day. It's in full swing. Did I mention it was hot and noisy? So the 2013 Southern Alberta floods were an event where there was heavy snowpack in the mountains a year, much like 2022. Um, but unlike 2022, there was heavy rain in the forecast and very warm temperatures. 
13,000 residents were evacuated from the town of High River. 100,000 were displaced in Calgary. The Trans-Canada Highway was washed out in multiple places uh, in the Canmore area. Fiber optic lines were cut that carry national traffic. Uh, rail lines were washed out. Widespread power and, um, and spotty communications outages. So the impact was we scrambled as radio amateurs to help ad hoc with served agencies because there was and remains no formal uh, agreement in place with these served agencies. From a recovery perspective, we stood up intermediate support, immediate support, excuse me, around the clock to provide auxiliary communications for the first 72 hours. The town had nothing. Their radio system was out. We were it. Uh, they had no communications to the provincial operating center in Edmonton. We were it. And uh, our job was to ensure all volunteers knew what they were getting into. The photo in the lower right shows a uh, provincial premier at that time, Alison Redford, uh, coming in for her briefing. If you've often wondered, as I did before this event, why the premier or the, the prime minister or the president or whatever flies into a disaster area, it's because they are the people who carry the authorization to stroke a check ad hoc for more than $50 million. And that's what's needed to immediately fund relief. The dumpster repeater story. This is one of my favorite stories. At the Big White Winter Rally in 2018, we're on day two of a two-day event. There's a safety plan in place. I'm going to talk about safety plans in a bit. About 100 participants, 75 volunteers, 45 radio ops. It's a big operation. And we're located at the Big White Ski Resort just west of Kelowna, BC. We're handling this on mountain roads and clearly they're covered in snow. We call it Big White. And the uh, issue we had was the failure of the primary repeater frequency or the pr or primary repeater, excuse me, 15 minutes before the final stage commenced. Nightfall's coming, but the competitors aren't equipped with nighttime lighting because this is unexpected that they'd be delayed this long. And the lighting weighs extra and the race cars want to be as light as possible. So we had sudden loss of communications to the entire event. Everybody knew to go to the backup frequency, but this is a naturally quiet time in the event. So nobody knew the primary frequency had failed. So you can see in the photo that uh, there's a, a shovel. You can see it down in the lower right. And I grabbed my spare antenna from my kit and 100 feet of feed line which is the fast estimate of what I needed to get from where I was sitting to the dumpster. And I tossed my 5 8 mag mount on the recently cleared off top of the dumpster. And somebody helped me run the feed line in through the window, connected directly to my radio. We were running very small antennas in the room because we were very close to the repeater. We didn't need a lot of power. Flip my radio onto high power, invert the frequency. So I'm talking on the output and make the announcements, all stations, this is net control. The primary repeater has failed. Please switch to the backup. I repeated that message three times over five minutes while my other net control operator was listening to the backup frequency. And she started to take check-ins from people who got my message. And finally, eight minutes later, we were back on track. So you never know when it's going to happen. Here's some short stories. I've got a bunch of them. You might be beginning to think by now you're never going to invite Vince to an event because I might bring bad luck. The reality is I probably do half a dozen events a year and uh, less than one a year goes badly sideways. I've just been doing them for a while. Moose Mountain Bike Race in 2005, Kananaskis Country, Alberta. Uh, a, a competitor fell on trail and could not proceed further. And we had to work with backcountry rescue and helicopters to coordinate the evacuation of the participant 7,000 feet uh, above sea level and 3,000 feet above the area uh, elevation. So right on trail, it was a long line rescue. Uh, not far from Moose Mountain, the Powder Face Rally, uh, a competitor rolled a vehicle and we had 200 um, people in the intersection moving vehicles and sweeping the ground for all garbage and all foreign objects so that when the helo landed, it was not going to kick up anything other than dust because helicopter pilots tend to get real touchy about stuff getting sucked into their intake, as you can appreciate. 
in Invermere, Southern British Columbia in 2015. We're at the bottom of the course and the course uh, gains 2000 feet of elevation. It's an in and out style of course. So the competitors drive in, they execute a turnaround and then we run the stage in the opposite direction. At the bottom of the stage, it's just a little bit of drizzle. At the top of the stage, they get there and there's four inches of snow. The problem is they're running mud tires, not snow tires. And the temperature fell very quickly and it became ice very quickly. So we had to do a, uh, a very sequenced evacuation of the route to make sure nobody slid off the road because even the recovery vehicles were having trouble. I've got video of that linked on my website. There's a video on YouTube. And uh, most recently, uh, the MS bike tour in Southern Alberta in 2019, a sudden weather event uh, turned into a logistics challenge. So there's 600 people coming out for a pleasure ride one day up, one day back. It's a fun thing, right? And people are going, I don't want to ride in the rain. <laughs> and the rain fell rather suddenly. The event coordinator unilaterally made a decision without consulting the rest of the logistics team, of which I'm a member in committee to bus about two thirds of those people directly to the finish line. So the impact was the finish line's not ready for this. There's no coffee, there's no sandwiches, there's no hotel rooms set up. It's still an empty area because the crew that comes to set that up hadn't done that. See, logistics can get involved into many, many things in an event and many different things can go wrong that don't necessarily uh, involve, uh, thankfully, human injury. So switch gears with me now. Let's talk about preparation. Bob Yancer has one of my favorite quotes. Success is where preparation and opportunity meet. Another one, failing to prepare is preparing to fail, right? So these things uh, are absolutely key to how you respond when something goes sideways. Before anything else, preparation is a key to success. I didn't know Alexander Graham Bell had said that until I researched the quote. So the first step to having a positive outcome or a response to an unexpected situation is to think about it beforehand and mentally or physically rehearse. This is the art of pre-event preparation. So grab a copy of this while I talk. This is one of the first checklist. This is the first checklist. It's a really basic checklist. Take this, add to it, make it your own. Make sure the event has these items in particular. An event map with tactical locations noted is what you see on the screen. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. It's a fast way to reference um, the busy used or the frequently used uh, points on the course. Make sure there's instructions for the radio volunteers. Ask if there's a safety plan. Now, if you're in net control, you should have a copy of that safety plan ready and you should have read it before the event started so that you're familiar with where to find things. If you're a participant, ask if there's a safety plan. If there isn't, you can question for yourself whether you want to partake or not. Because if they haven't planned for safety, what else have they missed? Get a copy of the event schedule so you know where to be when. Make sure there's a clearly communicated command structure so you know who to ask for help when you need it. For committee members and for those in logistics, make sure that you have emergency contact numbers for all of your peers on the committee because you never know who you're gonna need. When we had to bus 400 people up to the destination at the bike tour, I needed to get a hold of the people as a logistics lead. I needed to get a hold of the people that were coordinating the food and the coffee and make sure that stuff landed. And then I walked over to the hotel desk and I said, everybody's arriving four hours early, get ready for the onslaught. And they weren't ready, so they hustled. And make sure there's predefined zones or points for emergency services as required. When we landed that helo in the middle of the gravel intersection, it wasn't defined. And STARS needed from us, uh, the air ambulance service, they needed to exact lat and long. Now, in 20 or whatever that was, lat and long were not that easy to come by as they are today because we, we all didn't carry a GPS with us. So today what we do is we predefine points on a map and we file a plan with uh, air rescue and we say, this is rescue point Charlie. And we mark that on the map and they know exactly where to go. And all they have to do at dispatch is input those coordinates and send them off dispatch to the aircraft. It's a real basic checklist. Please take this and make this your own. Are you slated to be a net control operator at an event? Get involved. 
seen here are some of the photos of the documents that I've collected over the years with permission of the event uh, organizers. When a new committee asks me, well, what's in a safety plan? What does a, you know, an, an air ambulance plan look like? I've got them. And I can hold them up and I can lend them out and I can say, here's what's in it. Here are the elements you could consider for your event because every event is unique, right? One of the best ways for net control operator to be in the know is to be involved before that event happens. So sit on the organizing committee and help develop event materials with radio in mind. Speak up whenever possible. Be a participant in the event itself before you attempt to operate as net control. Familiarity with the event will really help you quite a lot if you're in logistics or net control. Here's another checklist for your collection, another starter checklist as I call it. In the weeks, not the days before the event, review your gear checklists. You do have checklists, right? Exercise and test your gear, charge your batteries, test your cables. Ah, this is where the generator story comes in. 2022 field day, that's this year. I own two Honda generators, two Honda EU 2000s. Phil knows what those are. And they pull start regularly, predictably, even if they've been sitting for a while. Except this year, one didn't. And I had to scramble on the day before field day to get it to a mechanic to clean out the carburetor because I didn't know how to do that. Now, had I pull started it a week before, I wouldn't have scrambled. I still would have had to find the mechanic, but I wouldn't have scrambled like I did and lost half a day of preparation immediately before the event. Check your stuff a week before you go out. Perform unexpected repairs as they are needed. If you discover you've got a bad cable in any event, tag the cable, a piece of electrical tape, a, a paper clip, something, you know, write a note. Fix it as soon as you get home. Don't put it off. Review the event materials as they are published. And this equally applies if you're in logistics or if you're a participant. Review them as they're published. Get familiar with the event. Get it in your mind. This is part of that pre-event rehearsal. And event coordinators, um, they hold briefings for operators. Uh, attend those last-minute briefings because they'll likely contain information that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Continuing on the theme of soft skills, we are all leaders. We are leaders of teams. We are leaders of ourselves. Leadership doesn't always imply leading others. It's equally important to ensure you are leading yourself during challenging times. So, you know, a thousand books have been written about the topic. I'm not going to go too deep on this, but it's this is about rather how it relates to events in the amateur radio response. So I'm going to distill it down to the four points here on the screen. Clubs and events, take note. What's a leader? It's one who can manage activities, usually of self, always of self, excuse me, and usually of others. Leaders aren't hereditary or imposed. In the context of ham radio activities, the best leader isn't always the guy with the most gear or the most knowledge. Leaders' roles need definition too. Not just the guy who showed up to do timing and scoring, but leaders need this too. So to event organizers and to clubs, I say, consider what you want in a leader before choosing that person. Hey, here's a radical concept. Interview them for the job. Find out if they want to do it. All too often, I've met coordinators who went, yeah, the club asked me to do it, and I felt like I should, so I said yes, but I really don't want to. Wow, you just have to ask. Listen, about leadership, it's said that people join an organization, or in this context, an event, year after year, because they believe in the cause, right? Whatever that cause is, they leave that org because of poor leadership or poor direction. So the benefit to the club or the event is when you have good leadership, people stick around and come back year after year. How cool is that? Here's another starter checklist. Grab a copy of this while I'm talking about it. It's a short but really important checklist. Now I've made it basic on purpose because the details underneath this list are really event specific. As a leader, 
Your job is to ensure, ensure at all times your team members are safe, informed, and any questions they have are answered. Now, your job is many other things, but those are the core. I could, I could easily also say getting rid of their roadblocks or their impedances so they can do their job well. Well, leading yourself, it's your job to ensure that you speak up and ask questions, that you know your personal safety plan, that you have all the documentation you need to perform your duties and you're prepared to assist and the risks are managed or understood. So let me speak to that a little bit about personal risk. At an event, that's really anything from the sandwich I was promised by the event organizers didn't show up to knowing where to stand at a, a rally sport event so you don't get hurt. So I'm going to go so far as to say that if you can't say yes to all of these points, this is a very bold statement. You're not ready enough to participate in an event. Really, to me, it's that simple. Okay. Let's lighten it up a bit. Let's talk about uh, gear. We love our gear, right? Boy, making a go kit or a field kit isn't really all that difficult if you think about it ahead of time and design it with a purpose in mind. I'm a huge proponent of building for purpose. I don't just throw a bunch of stuff together and hope that it works. So uh, on this slide, you're going to see nine different kits uh, for nine different purposes. You've got everything in there from the Pelican case to the bag to uh, Bob here on the, on the left. He's got uh, a case that he's custom machined. He, it's an award-winning kit. Um, and uh, some bags at the top and uh, the ever popular gator case uh, in the center right. Let's design with purpose in mind. You might want multiple kits, one for summits on the air, another for community service events. Regardless how many kits you want or you need, the steps to design them are really the same. And your kits are likely gonna change over time. You know, um, uh, newsflash, I'm about to redesign my own kit, having used it for uh, three weeks, uh, just in uh, August and in this month. So go kits have two major categories. They're the kind that fit in a bag of some sort, like a backpack or a camera bag or a laptop bag. And there are those that fit into a box or an enclosure of some sort, like a gator case or plastic suitcase, Pelican, Nanook, uh, Princess Auto case, whatever, um, or something that's been built to suit. And there's two subcategories, they're battery powered or they're grid powered. All kits have at least these items, radio and power distribution. Beyond that, you're going to need antennas, antenna supports, feed line, power cables, manuals for your gear. Please bring manuals for your gear everywhere because it's, you're going to get to a point where you're looking at a function that you haven't looked at for two years and you're going to need it for the event. Oh, the number of times people have said to me in net control, I have a Kenwood blah, 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 or Yesu blah, blah, blah. Do you remember how to turn on the CTCSS tones? No, I don't own the radio. I don't know. Where's your manual? I think to myself, I don't say it out loud. Um, you're noticing in this list that what's missing there's a lot of things missing, but a microphone probably is missing. Not all events are phone events, so I don't list a microphone as a must-have. That's an optional. Define your electrical requirements. How are you going to power this thing? Are you going to plug it into commercial mains? Is it going to go to a generator, kind of related to commercial mains? Uh, are you running it off battery? Is, are you going to have some solar backup? What's your operating power level? Five watts, 100 watts? How long are you going to be operating? A few hours? Eight hours? You don't know, unlimited. How close is the power? Is it nearby or distant? Me, I, mine is uh, commercially powered. Although recently I built a battery pack to kind of mitigate that. Define your mechanical requirements. These are the two limitations, right? Power and mechanical. What size is it? Is it tiny? Is it going to be a one-hander? Some of those cute kits are cute, I'll admit. Is it going to be a luggable? Does it need a crew of roadies? Are you doing pallets on the air? Wade, I don't know if you're here today. Um, how, heavy, how heavy is it? Is it uh, three pounds, 10 pounds, 50 pounds? What form factor is it in? A small bag, a dedicated vehicle, a suitcase? And where are you going to sit it? Do you need to sit it on a table? Is it you're going to put it on the ground? You're going to wear it on your body. 
So look, there's, there is one thing to remember about this though. Uh, a kit with a narrow focus is going to be lightweight, but a highly flexible kit is anything but lightweight. Just keep that in mind. All right. So you've heard the stories. You've seen a quick way to define your needs for a go kit. Maybe by now you're wondering, okay, Vince, what's in your kit? So like I said earlier, it's about to change a result of my recent experiences, but that's okay. Here's how it sits right now. Your kit's likely going to change over time too. So keep that in mind. Well, what's in my kit? There's a lot. It didn't get here overnight. And it's constant evolution, as I've said before. As anyone who's climbed a steep trail knows, clearly I'm not doing summits on the air with this kit. I mean, people who do summits on the air have to be in shape. I'm in shape. My shape is round. That is the wrong shape for summits on the air. So I'm not doing that. But I want to have my home station replicated with me so that I can drop it out on a table four or five, six feet wide when I'm out and about. And I can do that with this setup. That's my goal. That's my purpose. So let's uh, go along from uh, left to right along the top and take a detailed tour of it now. Uh, I have a drop-in charger for my Yesu VX7s. Those are uh, waterproof or submersible radios. I have two of them and four batteries and three antennas and, and microphones and stuff. I've got, I've got the whole uh, family for that. I have an external speaker so I can hear the radio better. Uh, and it faces forward too because the speakers in, the, in my radios face upwards as most mobile form factor radios do. I have a creature comfort device. That means it's a little fan powered by USB five volts. So I've got 12 volt, five volt converters for that on board. A 12 volt power distribution strip, think rig runner. Uh, in the right hand case, I've got a really small uh, 30 ampere switching power supply made by PowerWorks. So that's uh, sitting underneath the uh, checker plate. I have a second external speaker, I have two radios. And then you can see the uh, 50 amp hour uh, light pull four bot battery pack. If you're interested in building one, you can see my build notes on my website. Along the bottom left to right, I have my five watt UHF data radio. This is a commercial grade uh, data radio, uh, along with a uh, Cantronics KPC TNC. And inside that case is a 19 inch uh, rare earth magnet uh, mag mount whip and a set of cables. So I can power it uh, from whatever I'm connected to at the time. And I call that my wind link to go kit because in this part of Southern Alberta, we are served by several UHF digipeters that service wind link. Coming in the left-hand kit, I have a headphones amp and that's a, a headphone amp. Uh, you know, you buy these at Long and McQuaid or similar music stores. It's made by Behringer in this case. And one of the channels uh, I circuit hacked and I put an LM386 module in it to give it two and a half watts output for speakers. So now I can drive independently. I run the radio run the radio into that amplifier and I can run a set of headphones on it for me so that I can isolate the noise out from logistics because logistics can get quite noisy, but I need to hear the radio. Um, and one channel is independently powering the speaker so everybody around me can hear what's going on as well because they like to hear that. Some event coordinators like to hear that. I have uh, an antenna tuner for HF frequencies. I have a sound card, uh, my signal link sound card. Uh, coming into the right-hand kit, I have a dual band cross band capable radio, in this case, a Yaesu 8800 um, and a Yaesu 857 uh, all mode radio, uh, along with the external LDG FT meter, which gives me additional functionality when I'm doing digital modes like WinLink. Um, so why do I have two radios in one case? Well, that's something that's going to change. But why do I carry two radios on my go kit? Because two is one and one is none. That's what the military says about redundancy. Uh, and very frequently at an event, um, I want to be able to listen to more than two frequencies at once. Now, I might have the volume down on one of them and really only one of them is active, but I want to be able to hear when there's traffic on the others. And then lastly, I have a, a Panasonic Toughbook uh, computer uh, running Windows 7 in this case, and there's a whole story behind that, which I won't bore you with today, but it's my radio computer and it's uh, it can take a licking and keep on ticking. Um, I hate to admit that I have dropped my computer a couple of times and it has survived to tell the tale. From a supporting gear perspective, uh, this is the gear that I carry and, and you're gonna need some of this too. Um, in a minute, I'll have the complete list up on screen so don't snapshot this just yet. I carry three pieces of uh, RG400 feed line and uh, some spare feed line, uh, not RG400. RG400, it's great, it's, it's uh, double shielded, so it's lower loss, but it's the size of RG58, uh, thereabouts, or RG8X. 
Um, it's Teflon coated, so it doesn't pick up mud. You can just wipe it dry and put it away. I carry a fan dipole for 80, 40, and 20 meters. I carry a Comet uh, uh, ground-mounted vertical or vertical and a tripod to mount it on and some counterpoises. I carry an N-Fed for three bands. Uh, I carry a diamond VHF UHF antenna goes on top of my 30-foot push-up mast with guy ropes and stakes. I can uh, attach that mast either to the rear of my RV. It's I'm fortunate it has a trailer hitch or to the back of my truck. I carry 120 volt extension cables. Remember, my kit is means powered, usually means powered. I carry headphones. I need to isolate sound when I'm in net control. So a set of Heil Pro 7s in my case, uh, your mileage may vary. Headphones are very much personal taste. And a set of Sony headphones with great big ear cuffs because uh, they're good for sound isolating. I carry a CW key because uh, despite my best efforts, I can still do a little bit of CW. Um, I think I suck at it. And the, the previously mentioned Panasonic Toughbook. Here's the whole list now. And usually I have these props ready to hold up in front of the camera, but uh, today I didn't do that. These are my problem solvers. And you're gonna notice four of them had two red asterisks beside them. And these are accept no substitutes. So accept substitutes at your own risk. 3M brand blue painter's tape. So you'll see, in, you've noticed in several of the photos, some blue tape. And I use this because I can take a sheet of paper, like a map or a schedule, and I can paste it on the wall in front of me. And I can pull it off the wall when I'm done three days later or two days later or a day later. And I don't take paint off the wall with me. It works really well and it sticks just enough. I carry an assortment of Sharpie branded markers. I carry colored ones and I carry metallic ones. What do I carry metallic ones to an event? You say, well, maybe I brought a new cable with me from home and I forgot to tag it. I'll take the metallic marker and on the black cable, I'll write LK. Last two letters, my call sign and the length of the cable so that it's easily identifiable in a glance. I know how big it is. I carry dollar store carabiners. I always have extra carabiners around my kit because as you can see in the photo here on the right, if you uh, use that and the Lee Valley tools, neodymium or rare earth magnet hooks. Um, and as long as you get neodymium, I'm not real hard pressed on Lee Valley, but get the, get the rare earth magnet hooks and don't get the cheap ones from the big box home improvement stores because they fall off. I get the neodymium ones because what I can do with these is I can use a ca I can route my coax cables through the carabiner, hook it on the hook, and put it up to a metal fixture of some sort. In the upper photo, it was a metal beam. Um, in the lower photo, it was the metal window frame. And that's why I got four pieces of feed line outside, two radio operators with two feed lines each. Easy way to get feed lines up and out of your net control position into the great outdoors. I carry writing sticks, clipboards, paper. I carry a stapler, I carry tape, <laughs> you know, all the things that you might need around the office, right? Um, I carry extra feed line and mag mount whips. You heard the story of the dumpster repeater. I carry a set of hand and soldering tools because invariably somebody says, oh, Vince is here, he can fix it. <laughs> and I carry an antenna analyzer because nothing's more frustrating than getting on a frequency and keying up and nothing happens. So well, what's the first thing you suspect? Either your radio or your antenna and maybe your power supply. So I carry an antenna analyzer and I can quickly suss out where a problem is. But seriously, as the expression goes, don't leave home without it. So look, I'm nearing my, the end of my time with you today. So I'm gonna leave you with just one more checklist to take away. I'm gonna tell you what's complete on the screen and gonna build to it. There's one element on the screen that in my mind is absolutely mandatory. Constantly reassess the situation and move forward. This prevents analysis paralysis. Shorter events may need shorter time windows that we're seeing here. But what you're seeing here is the mantra that I used when I was in the middle of the floods. Every four hours, stop, assess, and plan. Think 12 to 36 hours ahead. Now that goes hand in hand with um, go forward with the best information you have on hand at the time and reevaluate re it later and change your mind if you have to, right? But uh, don't, don't stop your activities just because you feel you don't have enough information. Sometimes you just got to move forward. So it's easy to build a list of do's and don'ts and don'ts are all too often the, the opposite of the do. And in my mind, that's a lazy guy's way out. So I didn't want to be lazy in, in front of this, uh, in front of all you people here today. Um, and, and that's not how I roll anyway. So I'm going to say, I'm not going to say don't, but avoid. So all too frequently, you know, that, that list is the opposite, right? So I'm not going to do that. So avoid showing up without your radio manual. 
<laughs> Have you heard me say the word manual a few times today? Really, I'm trying to drive a point home. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> uh, please do not self-deploy. Do not show up without orders or a request to do so. Nothing can throw a plan uh, off kilter than, than three people who said, I heard you needed people, I'm here. I still have no idea how Dave got through the front lines to me at the 2013 floods. I was thankful for him at the time, but I'm like, he self-deployed. He shouldn't have done that. Um, it worked once, but it doesn't always work. Avoid analysis paralysis. Use the mantra at the bottom of the screen, right? Avoid doing it all yourself. If you're a leader, you have other people you can rely on. Don't do it all yourself. Don't burn yourself out. Don't rehearse with out your gear. Avoid not rehearsing with your gear. All right, grab this list. Now it's complete. Do take some time to study the area beforehand. In my case, that means I read all the notes I'm given and I study Google Earth and Google Street View and I get a visual for what the area is. Sometimes I drive the area. Um, depending on what the nature of the event is. Plan out your what if scenarios. What are you going to do if? Know your people and know your resources. That's, um, um, that's methodology 101. No, that's ICS 101. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Know your people and your resources. Set ac appropriate expectations of your team. You will be going into an area where food or water will not be available to you for 12 hours. Please plan accordingly. Please plan for all weather conditions, whatever those instructions are. Stay flexible, hydrated, and rested because you need to keep a cool head at all times. Take extra dry socks. Your feet will thank you. I, I take extra dry socks to every event. Um, make decisions based on the information you have on hand and revise them again later. I said that already. And then review the event immediately afterwards with your team as it builds your lessons list to document. Like, so do a hot wash. That's what, um, that's what rescue organizations call it. A hot wash. What worked, what didn't. Oh, what's a lessons listed? Everybody's familiar with the term lessons learned. We all sit down after a project or an event. We build the lessons learned. Uh -uh. It ain't lessons learned until you put it in practice. You're only listing the lessons. Build your lessons listed. They're important. And remember, don't ever forget, leadership is both of others and of yourself. So the list equally applies if you're running the event or you're a participant. So I hope you found all this information helpful and thought provoking today. I thank you so very much uh, for being here. Oh, look, there's a couple of points. I made a few points, actually. Um, that I didn't speak to around interoperability. There's technical interoperability, things like frequency and mode and connectors and power connectors to use power poles or not. Uh, that's, a, that's a holy discussion for another time, but, and behavioral. These are all things that need to come from the event leadership so that people know what the interoperability standards are. Um, and behavioral interoperability, things like ICS as a practice so that we all have a common footing. Um, they, these are all promoted by leaders to ensure we can work together in harmony. Um, here's some tips I picked up just yesterday at the QSO Today Expo. Uh, don't take parts of one kit to feed another. If you're missing a part, order it. Make sure your kits stay complete and your checklists stay uh, intact. So, I, I, again, I thank you for inviting me to present today at the 2022 Radio Amateurs of Canada Conference. I am very honored and humbled to be here. If I'm unable to address uh, your question once the floor though opens up, please drop me an email and I'll reach out to you as I can. Thank you very much in 73. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Vince. That was uh, wonderful information and uh, boy, uh, uh, what great uh, work that you've put together uh, for these uh, getting prepared for these emergencies. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, here that uh, maybe we can share. One was, uh, how do we found, uh, find out about these events that are going on? And you know, these, attend. these are promoted usually through the local radio clubs. So get, uh, get plugged into the radio clubs. Uh, to hear what's coming up. Even if you're not a member, get involved in the local radio club so that you can find out what's coming up. Good. 
Um, excellent. Uh, somebody also suggested that Prince uh, Princess Auto is a good place to get uh, a lot of these uh, equipment that you mentioned in, in your lists and the cases and that with it. Somebody shared. Yep. Um, uh, also, um, Grimlocks are a very good option for carabiners. Uh, uh, somebody has used that. And then, of course, um, somebody asked, what model of an antenna lizer, uh, do you use and uh, in your kits, uh, or what would you suggest? You know, any antenna analyzer, the best antenna analyzer you've got is the one that's in your hand. I'm not brand specific about this. I'm, I'm real hard line on you should carry one with you. I carry a rig expert. It wasn't the one I always carried. Uh, a nano VNA, just anything to analyze your antennas so that you've got some idea what that antenna is doing is incredibly helpful. Right. Another member said, uh, you know, keep a copy of PDF of your manuals in yes. the kits too. That always helps because uh, yeah. never fails. Eh? On my iPad in iBooks, I have PDFs of all my manuals, but if that's the only place I carry them and my iPad fails, that's a single point of failure. I'd rather have the manuals sitting in a box in my truck where I can walk over to them and get them when I need them. Absolutely. Well, again, Vince, uh, I'm sorry we don't. I'm sure there's all kinds of quen uh, questions. As Vince mentioned, uh, please feel free to email him and follow up with him if you have specific questions and, uh, and that with it. On behalf of uh, the RAC executive and uh, all, we thank you so much, uh, Vince, for uh, coming and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us this afternoon. It was very informative, and we appreciate you uh, uh, sharing your time with us. Well, thank so you so much for having me and uh, 73. Okay, thanks a million, uh, Vince. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, attending this uh, first track. Again, I apologize for the technical uh, uh, problems that we had at the beginning, but we'll uh, hopefully get those rectified as we continue on this afternoon. Uh, the links are in the 